I want to mention the name of a movie. I want to see how many people saw this movie a little while back. As Good As It Gets. How many saw that movie? As Good As It Gets. That many people, huh? Yeah, it was a movie with uh, Jack uh, Nicholson and I think Helen Hunt was uh, in that movie. It's a little while back. It was a, uh, I guess it was a romantic comedy. And in that movie, uh, Jack Nicholson plays the part of a paranoid hermit. A paranoid hermit. He's, he's stuck to his apartment. He's afraid to go out of his apartment and you know, he's obsessive and so on and so forth. And despite his grouchy personality and his fear of relationships, he falls in love with the waitress. He only goes to one restaurant. He always sits in the same spot, has to have the same silverware, you know. And he's really bad with her. He's grouchy with her and everything. Uh, but during their unlikely romance, somehow the romance starts. Uh, she's a single mom and he does a favor for her little boy and so on and so forth. So there's a little romance that starts with them. And uh, you, know, you follow the movie as these two try to uh, you know, have a relationship. And the woman, frustrated by his difficult personality, finally, they go to a restaurant, he makes a fool of himself, you know, and finally she's exasperated with him and she challenges him to just give me one, just give me one reason why I should continue in this relationship. Just one reason, she says. And in one of the best lines in the movie, Nicholson looks at her for a moment and he answers, you make me want to be a better man. And when you, when you hear him say that, you make me want to be a better man, I mean, you could even, I remember seeing this movie at the movies and the audience went, oh, you know, oh, you know. And of course she went, oh, you know. That's a turning point in their, uh, in their relationship. And of course, this uh, melts her heart <clears throat> and the couple, they move on you know, to a happy ending at the, at the movie. Now, if you remember the movie, there are plenty of ideas and positions in this movie that you know, I don't personally agree with as a, as a Christian. I always tell people I watch movies for entertainment, not for doctrinal value. <clears throat> if, I don't, if I don't learn about the Bible, I come to church. But the essential theme of this movie, you know, man's yearning to be better, that's the essential theme of that movie. I can agree with that. I think everybody can identify with that idea. You know, we want to be better people. Now in the movie, the love of a good woman was the motivation to change Jack Nicholson's character into a more caring and kind person. I mean, that's okay for a movie you know, where we want an easy and a happy ending, everything wrapped up in two hours so we can get home. But in real life, becoming a better person may require more than just somebody's love, although that can be an important factor in our transformation. In real life, we tend to repeat losing behavior over and over again and we end up trapped in negative circumstances created by our reoccurring bad habits. We keep doing the same bad things over and over again. And so in real life, the secret to correcting bad behavior and actually becoming a better person is to replace the elements of bad behavior with good and positive things in our lives, and that's not always easy to do. Jesus explains this principle in Luke. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 11, verses 24 to 28. And he says the following, <coughs> excuse me. Luke 11, verse 24, he says, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. So in this very short passage, the Lord explains that it isn't enough to get rid of bad habits, not enough just to get rid of bad thoughts, evil intentions, you have to actually replace these things with good and positive 
active things. You can't just sweep out the old, you got to put something new inside in order to replace the old because eventually, invariably, people just, you know, they just go back to the old way. If you don't, he says, in this passage, you will eventually become worse than you were, not better. So it's not age that changes you. you know, people think, oh, as you grow older, you get. it's not age that changes you. It's change that changes you. You got to change, you got to make changes. And so tonight I want to talk about three changes in particular that are necessary if you're going to become a better person. Now if you don't want to be a better person, just bear with me for the next 20 minutes. You know, and, but if you're thinking of maybe trying to be a better person, here are a couple of things. Not everything, it's not an exhaustive list, but here are three things that you need to change. Number one, you have to change your playground. You have to change your playground. I mean, there are some places that you simply have to stop going to if you want to become a better person. I mean, some of these places you know, are physical in nature. Maybe there's a friend's house who has the Playboy channel that, that seems to be on from time to time. Maybe you, you don't need to go there. Or maybe there are places that serve alcohol if that's your particular problem. You know, if your particular problem is alcohol, it wouldn't be a good idea for you to become a bartender. You know? Simple things. Now everybody knows which places have the greatest temptation for you. And if you want to be a better person, you, you must not go there. Solomon in the books of Proverbs talks a lot about playgrounds that you should avoid. Proverbs 2 verse 12 he says, wisdom will save you from the adulteress for her house leads down to death. Her house, her activity, the adulteress. Is there someone that tempts you towards sexual sin? Don't go there, don't be with that person. Let that go. You know, in a counseling course I took many years ago in college, uh, not necessarily how to counsel other people, but how the counselor himself or herself should act. One of the points made there is, if you're counseling with someone and you feel sexually attracted to them, and you say to yourself, I can handle it, you're already in trouble. You're already in trouble. If you said, oh, I can handle this, you are in trouble. You've just stepped over the line. That's one of the places you mustn't go. Don't go there if you want to be a better person. In Proverbs 3.33 he says, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked. Don't go there to the house of the wicked. Parents know this, right? Pretty basic thing. You parents that have children that are old enough to leave the house by themselves and go to a friend's house, don't you ask those questions? Who's over there? Their parents there? What does her dad do? Is her mom there? Family? You know, you're, you're poking. Oh, mom, you're being so nosy. No, no, I want to know where you're going. Paul says, the apostle says, we should abstain from every appearance of evil. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Every appearance of evil. Boy, I think that's the most quoted verse that I personally quoted to my own children as they were growing up. What do you mean we can't do that? Well, you know, it doesn't say in the Bible you period, you're not allowed to do this. You know, teenagers are experts in splitting hairs and things. You know. And my answer would be, but there is an appearance of evil here. Why can't I go to the casino? I just want to watch the show. Really? You want all your friends from church really to observe you? you know? We cannot become better people without changing the places where our moral and spiritual failures are most likely to occur. When you're saying to yourself, I, can't ha I can handle it, it's because you know that you're putting yourself in some sort of moral, spiritual danger and you're trying to convince yourself that you can handle it. And the question is, why do you do that? 
Why should you even be so close to something where you have to convince yourself that you can really handle it? To correct losing behavior and become better people, we have to exchange these with places that will help us to be better. David the psalmist said, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the house of the wicked. Psalm 84 verse 10. Now let's face it, you cannot be just a hermit, you know what I'm saying? You can't just join a monastery, hide yourself away from the world, can't do that. You have to aggressively seek places that will provide the best opportunity for self-improvement. For example, improving your environment at home by removing those things that might bring you down. Books, magazines, movies, resources, things you know, that will be a snare to you. You got to get rid of that stuff. Do you know where most young men Boys, I should say boys. Do you know the, where most young boys consume their very first portion of pornography or alcohol? In their own house. In their own house. They find dad's magazine stashed under wherever. Or they reach up into the top closet and they find you know, the booze is up there out of reach. They find it in the house, or in grandpa's house, or uncle's house. Being at worship and Bible study regularly so that your life and your lifestyle is anchored by this place and its influence. That's how you improve. Finding places where you can be of service will definitely cause personal growth and improvement. You know, I tell my children, I used to tell them when they were younger, you know, the best place to find a future spouse is in church, not at a bar. You know. Of course, that's not the only thing. I know people, you know, some people out there say, yeah, well my sister, she married a guy in church and they were divorced two years later, he cheated on her. Well, yeah, does that happen? Sure, it happens. But compare the success rate of Christians who marry each other to the success rate of people who marry non-Christians, people who have absolutely no use for Christianity, and you'll see that there's a big difference. In the end, the choice of place to be can usually be decided rather easily. Ask yourself, will Jesus be in this place? Would Jesus be honored in this place? Can I do the work of Jesus in this place? Will the Lord bless me because I have chosen to be in this place? Go ahead, have the courage to ask yourself those questions and they will help you decide where you should go and which places you should avoid. So if you want to become a better person, by all means, you need to change your playground. Another change necessary in order to become a better person, change your playmates. Change your playmates. Few choices in life are as crucial to our well-being and success as the choice of people that we make to be our friends and our associates. In other words, our playmates. The Bible is quite clear on this subject when it warns, do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Now the scriptures also provide numerous examples of men and women being led astray by the influence of other people. For example, Lot's family was influenced by the inhabitants of Sodom, leading to sin and destruction. In Genesis 19 we read about that. And Aaron, uh, Moses' brother, listened to the unfaithful among the people and was led into idolatry by making a golden calf. Exodus 32. 
and Solomon's wisdom could not protect him from the influence of his pagan wives. Look how wise he was, and yet he did the most foolish of things, the basic thing that God had told him not to do. And this man, considered the wisest in history, did exactly the opposite of what God told him. He said, don't associate, don't yoke yourself with foreign wives. And what did he do? He married foreign wives. Even Peter the Apostle was, was pressured by the Judaizers to distort the gospel for a period of time until Paul rebuked him in Galatians chapter two. Let's face it, we are easily molded by the actions and the character of our friends and our business associates. You know, my mother, who's passed away many, many years, but one of the most aggravating things about my mother was that she knew what I was up to simply by examining my friends. And it was very aggravating. A buddy of mine would come over and he wouldn't be in the house five minutes. Just, come, I came to get Mike, you know, and he's, uh, okay, I'll be down in a minute, I just got to get my hat, you know, and I'll get my hat. Okay, mom, we're going, we'll see you. And then we go out and then I come back and she said, I don't like him. Ma, he was here five minutes. No, no, he's not right for you. Ma, you don't know that we're smoking. <laughs> He's the one buying me the cigarettes. She knew, she had this thing, I don't know, the radar, mom's radar, you know. He didn't have to be in the house for three days, five minutes. I only wish she'd be a little more, you know, diplomatic about it. You know, son, about that young man that came by, I don't want to hurt your, no, she just go, I don't like him. <laughs> oh man. You know, the old saying is so very true, birds of a feather do flock together, for better, but also for worse. If you want to be a better person, then you need to associate with people who can help you to be a better person. You don't need 50 of these people, one would be enough, but it needs to be one who is better and who can encourage and stimulate you to becoming better. In school, they choose the best students to tutor the weaker students. In the military, they select the most experienced and disciplined soldiers to train the recruits. In life, we must also seek out those who have proven and demonstrated their success, usually in the areas of our failures or weaknesses, and cultivate friendships and associates with those people. Our problem is that we usually find it easier to maintain friendships with those people who share our weaknesses and who will not challenge us to do better. I remember way back when we you know, started the church in, uh, in Montreal, in Verdun, way, way, way back at the beginning. And I mean, we had to put signs inside the church building, never mind outside, we had to put signs inside the church building that said no smoking. Because you know, the people that we were converting, brand new Christians, first generations, you know, they, they came, they were in the world. And many of them had a lot of issues still that we were working through. I mean, they believed, they were happy to be Christians, be forgiven for their sins, you know, but they still had many vices, let's put it that way, that we were working on slowly. And smoking was like, oh man, half the church you know, smoked in those days. And we had to put signs, please do not smoke, don't smoke here, no smoking there. I preached sermons on it. And the thing that was interesting was all the smokers hung together. <laughs> they all hung together. And I'd observe it, you know, I'd see you know, somebody be baptized, you'd, preach, you know, you'd be studying with them, so on and so forth, you know, and, then, and then they start coming to church. You know, and the, who they'd be hanging with, because it wasn't a huge, you know, we were maybe 40, 50, who they'd be hanging with depended on who, if they smoked or not. And I remember you know, doing sermons saying, or you know, exhortations saying, look, if six of you go downstairs after Bible class and you're all smoking at the front door, this is not a good witness for us. And it was hard for them to break the habit 
because they had a support group going. You know? They had a smoker, they had a we keep smoking support group going <laughs> that they wouldn't let go. And it was, well, I'll quit if you quit. Well, I'm not ready yet. Well, I'm not ready either. And that's what happens. It's comforting to know that our friends won't judge or try to change us or themselves so that everybody can continue to enjoy their sins and their failures without guilt. You know what other little thing that really, gossip. Gossip's like that. If you got a nice juicy morsel, you know what I mean? And you, go, you won't go to that person that you know who will say, hey, 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 no, I'm sorry. Hey, let's not do that. Let's not talk about Joe that way. That's not a good thing. You know, let's not, we're not, that's not Christian. I mean, that's the last person you're going to, who are you going to find? Well, you're going to find that person, you know, that if you say, hey, I don't want to gossip, but, and they say, what, 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 tell me. <laughs> that's the person you're looking for. Because they won't call you on it. They won't judge you on it. Solomon says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Proverbs 27, 17. You know, we sharpen each other or we dull each other out, one or the other. To become a better person, we need to replace the bad influences around us with good ones, even if it scares us a little bit. It's okay, we'll make it. In order to have the new character, we sometimes have to experience the pain of having the old one stripped away in the fires of a challenging friendship. That's what's fantastic about Christian friendship. True Christian, in true Christian friendship, we're not worried about sharpening each other. That's the one thing that I appreciate so much, well, one of the many things I appreciate so much about my wife. She is always eager to do what's best. You know? She's always eager to do what's right. And that gets on my nerves sometimes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, somebody will say, yeah, we're looking, we're, you know, the, they're, they're, they're starting a collection for something. Oh, let's give to that. Wait, wait, wait not so fast. You know? But I am always confident that if there's a good thing that I have seen that maybe we ought to do, I am always confident that she will be an enthusiastic partner to do what is right and good. She sharpens me. Those are the kinds of, certainly the kind of partner we need in marriage, of course, but those are the kind of friends that we need to have that'll push us and help us to grow in Jesus in Jesus Christ. All right, one other thing in order to become a better person. So change our playground, change our playmates, and then the third one, change our playthings. Change our playthings. You know, recreation is meant to be a blessing when it is virtuous and balanced and controlled. For many today, however, recreation is immoral or obsessive or out of control. You, you know, I mean, it doesn't happen here very much, but we see in Europe uh, you know, the soccer matches that just break out into riots and people get killed. And the, you know, it's just ugly. I mean, it's sport. So much of what we view under the guise of entertainment many times degrades us or diminishes us as human beings. Jesus reminds us, your eye is the lamp of the body. When your eyes are good, your whole body, he says, is full of light. But when they are bad, your body also is full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Luke 11, 34 and 5. Our playthings, be they TV or movies, internet, music, games, activity, whatever, whatever they are, must not be the cause of us being less than what we have been called to be by Christ. So if your, if your playthings make you less 
than you are in Christ, then you need to get rid of those playthings. Imagine you're saying, well, for the next two hours, I'm really not going to be a Christian because a Christian would not be doing this, but I like doing this, so I'm just going to put aside my Christianity and I'm going to enjoy this thing, whatever that is. Sometimes our playthings are not bad in themselves, but we allow them to take over our lives to such a point that we neglect the important things in our lives, like caring for our families, or worship, or fellowship with the saints, or service, or work in the name of the Lord, or perhaps even our careers. We ignore these things just to play. You know, if your eye only sees your playthings, your games, your recreation, to the point where you no longer see your Lord or your brethren or your ministry or your family, then you are indeed, you're filled with darkness. That's what Jesus says. You, know, you think you see, but you don't. What you see is darkness. There's no light in you. So becoming a better person requires us to exchange the things that only give us pleasure with things that bring God pleasure. And I'm not talking about being in church all the time. I mean things that edify us in Christ and activities that build us up in the kingdom, activities that honor God. I can see a musical and and, and be edified and say, you know, and be a, appreciative of how well the musicians play and, and, and whatever, you know, how the thing is done. I can give glory to God. Isn't it Beethoven that on every manuscript that he wrote, you know, would put the end, you know, would begin it with to the glory of God? He understood that his great gift was a gift from God. And his music was in a way something that honored God. And I believe that so, all the gifts that we have. If I can run fast, who, made, who put me together so that I could run faster than anybody else? Well, I think God did. And if I can throw a ball far, or if I can sing a beautiful song, or play an instrument, or whatever, whatever I do. If I have a great imagination to build buildings that are you know, spectacular, I mean, all of this is from God and gives God honor and, and glory. So I don't mean we eliminate all forms of recreation, but we, we need to judiciously remove those things that hold us back from growing in wisdom and stature in the knowledge of Christ. Paul says, when I was a child, I used to speak as a child, think as a child, reason as a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. So many people for so long hold on to the childish things of their immaturity and refuse to grow up and be fully grown men and fully grown women of God. So if you want to be a better person, you have to exchange the toys of childhood for the tools of ministry that God provides the saints for service. Service to their families, absolutely. Service to their congregation, of course. And service to this lost and troubled and hurting world. And so becoming a, a better person is a desire shared by actually a majority of people, after all, very few, have you ever heard anybody say, man, oh man, I am working on really ingraining my smoking habit. I mean, I can't wait till I get up to two packs a day. And you know what? I've started to train Junior too, boy. He's up to half a pack a day. And <laughs> have you ever heard of anybody say anything foolish? Like, of course not. Even the most, I pick smoking because it's easy. You know what I'm saying? It's an easy vice. But all the smokers I've ever met, if they begin to talk, they always say, yeah, I got to quit this thing one day. Even they know that you know, some, one of these days I got to get rid of this thing. It's not good for me. Exactly. So even then, that individual is saying, I need to be better in this area. Everybody wants to be better. Everybody wants to improve. So this evening, I've just shared with you a few basic changes that need to take place if a person is to become better. Because I'm always interested in the mechanics of things. I like the theory, I like ideas, but I'm most interested in how do you translate ideas 
into reality. How do you get it done? How does A connect to B and, and how will it work? And so it's not enough to, for the preacher to get up and say, hey, we need to be better people. Well, boy, anybody can get up and say that. But how do we do it? Well, tonight there's a few things. Again, not an exhaustive list. A couple of things that you can, you can do to become a better, a better person. Change the places and the people and the things that drag you down and put in their place those people and places and things that embody the type of person that you want to become. Of course, after saying all of this, I want to make one more important point in order to keep all of this in perspective. Becoming a better person is not what saves us. Let's remember that. Believing and obeying Christ, that's what saves us. A non-Christian can improve himself to better his life here on earth, but no amount of personal improvement can atone for past sins and mistakes. The only way we can be good enough for God is by washing our sins away in the waters of baptism. Acts 22, 16. And a Christian seeks to be better herself in response to God's grace. She grows because of God's blessing. She makes an effort to improve as a response of thanksgiving and love, not as a way to save herself or a way to achieve personal righteousness. My lesson tonight wasn't a gospel sermon. It was an edification sermon. Christians are made right and acceptable in God's eyes through continued faith in Jesus, not through personal growth. Let's make sure we know the difference there, okay? So seek to become a better person, to take advantage of your blessings, to honor Christ. Seek to become a better person, to be productive in service to others, to experience personal satisfaction, to realize your full potential, to know more inner peace. You know, if you want those things, then seek to be a better person. But if you want to be perfect in God's eyes, well, that's another story. If you want to be perfect in God's eyes, then you have to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow Jesus. For He is the only way to perfection, salvation and righteousness. So if you need help to become a better person, a better Christian, uh, our sister this morning, for example, the perfect example of that, realized in her life things needed to get better. She didn't need to become a Christian, she was already a Christian. She just wanted to become a better Christian. And so what did she do? Well, she availed herself of the avenue of prayer and support from the elders and the congregation. That was the right thing for her to do. Now, on the other hand, if somebody wants to be a Christian, well, no, no amount of personal improvement is going to you know, achieve that. The only way to become a Christian to have our sins forgiven once and for all is by repenting of those sins, acknowledging or confessing our faith in Jesus Christ and being buried in the waters or being immersed in the waters of baptism to wash away sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. So if you need to be perfect, if you need your sins washed away, then in this way we can help you tonight. Uh, if you will come forward and let us know how we can minister to you.